Hello, my name is Fabian Fusse and I'm a university professor and journal editor. In this video, I will introduce uh, you scale development on validation. Are you planning to develop your own scale? Let me guide you through a scale development and how to do it right. The process of scale development can be divided into three phases. Yeah, some even would divide it further into a further scale, uh, phases. Here in a very simplified way, let's uh, talk only about three phases. Phase one would be about scale generation, about the items and the scales, how to uh, develop and uh, generate them. In the second phase, we would uh, look into refining them. And then finally, in the third phase, we would validate the scale. Once then you have uh, completed that process, the scale is ready for use in, in your research projects. Starting with phase one. The objective of phase one is to define your construct and to define and identify your dimension or if you have a multi-dimensional scale, your dim dimensions and maybe sub-dimensions. That would be usually based on literature. You would carefully uh, review the ex excellent literature, uh, be very clear about your, your construct. Ideally, also there should be a theory behind it. It should be theory driven. In the next step, uh, we would maybe go further into literature, not just looking at the overall construct, but maybe also into very specific items. Maybe some related uh, scales exist, or maybe some related ideas exist. It could be also in conceptual or qualitative work, and then it's about you to develop a scale, uh, to measure uh, that uh, construct. Furthermore, uh, you would also uh, like to validate your items and your scales uh, in terms of external validity, what it is and how it could be measured. Uh, and you would generate items, but you would already maybe have some experts. Uh, there could be people who are knowledgeable about that, or maybe also your target population. Uh, if you're studying expatriates, you would maybe serve expatriates. Uh, not survey, you would interview and ask them about certain constructs and items, whether they make sense to them. You could also ask some other experts, other maybe researchers, other consultants, or people who know about it. Yeah, and so in this phase, in somewhat you have two sub-phases. The first part is defining constructs, identifying dimensions, and then the second part we really go into the items. You try to generate a list of items and already review the items uh, through expert interviews. That uh, concludes then phase number uh, one. The question then is uh, that I sometimes hear is how many items do I need uh, for one dimension, for one scale? I think we have to think backwards. Uh, for me, an ideal number of items for a scale would be three, or let's say three to five. Because you need three to have a nice variation in terms of your scale. But in order to uh, arrive at three items in your final scale, you would start with a much larger number of items. It's hard to say. Based on my own experience, you can divide the number of initial item pool, maybe by two or maybe by three. So meaning, here this example, you have in phase one, maybe you would start uh, with eight items. In phase two, yeah, then maybe you have to drop items. In phase three, maybe you have to drop more items. So maybe at the very initial stage, maybe if you would like to end up with three items, maybe it's better to start with eight items at the beginning. And then it will shrink uh, uh, throughout this process. Now I'm coming to phase number two. It's about scale refinement. What you would typically do is you would run an exploratory factor analysis. Uh, the objective is uh, to check your dimensionality. If you have proposed three dimensions, you would like to test through an exploratory analysis whether uh, indeed uh, this analysis identifies three dimensions. And then maybe also whether your items load on your a proposed dimension and not on other dimensions. Typically, we would run pilot study one on a sample of two to three hundred uh, respondents and then run this exploratory factor analysis yeah, and check the dimensionality and reduce items. It's very common yeah, that we drop items uh, during this process. 
we would item we would drop items if the factor loading on its respective factor is rather low maybe below 0.4 or below 0.5 and or if uh, that item has a high uh, cross loading with another dimension that is, is not supposed to load on at this stage also you will check for reliability or Kronbass alpha it should be at least above 0.7 now imagine uh, we have uh, completed the uh, phase to we can move on to phase three. Typically what we would do is then we collect another sample, pilot study two maybe. Uh, at least 200 or maybe 300 respondents should participate. We have now a reduced number of items, maybe even a reduced number of dimensions. Uh, and we would then uh, provide this list of items to our new sample uh, to evaluate the scale. In contrast to exploratory effect analysis, we force you know, all items into their respective dimensions. A typical factor analysis could look like this one. We have maybe three dimensions, each with uh, different items. Uh, and then we would look in, uh, in, into the model fit. We would look into the factor loadings, whether each uh, item loads on its respective factor. Uh, and then we can determine uh, the model. There are some very rough cutoff criteria that has been proposed. Here I've listed some of the most important ones. In addition, of course, you would always report chi-square, degrees of freedom, and there are many other criteria. But the most common ones would be probably CFI and TLI. Yeah, so these indicators, we would usually say they should be at least 0.9 or higher. That would be the loose criteria. The more stricter one would be higher than 0.95. And then we have our RMSEA, and then it should be below 0.08 or below 0.06 if we use, use the more stricter number. If you're developing a scale, I would usually recommend to apply more stricter rules here, because if you would like to apply your scale elsewhere, you have a different sample and so forth, it's not perfectly fitted to the sample, then uh, maybe also the model fit and all these indicators would be lower. So it would be safer to be more critical here at this development stage. Also, there's the question. Now, uh, uh, your model does not uh, meet these uh, criteria. Yeah, model fit is much lower, CFI is much lower and so forth. What do you do? If you're developing a new scale, and you would first look into uh, factor loadings, uh, error correlations, maybe modification indices and so forth. If you're doing scale development, uh, you would usually drop items. That's also why I recommend you should have more items to begin with, so you can drop them later on. If you're not developing a scale, but you're just validating, you have used another scale and now you apply them in your uh, research context, then maybe you can also think about error collations, yeah? connecting certain error terms. If it is justified, you would look into the wording, if the wording is somewhat similar, and you would do so. But for scale development purpose, rather you drop items that would... Uh, for scale validation, it is extremely important to establish discriminant validity, meaning to show that your variables are distinct, distinct from one another. In particularly, it would be extremely important to show that your independent variable is distinct from your dependent variable, meaning they're not the same, there's not much overlap. There are different ways how to do so. It's also somewhat field specific. In uh, management research, organizational behavior research, it is very common yeah, to conduct multiple confirmatory effect analysis. You would compare different uh, confirm uh, results of confirmative effect analysis and you would use different numbers of variables. You may combine certain variables, maybe the original model has six factors, and then you would run the five factor model where you combine maybe independent dependent variable, or you would combine different variables. You would compare the full model with maybe reduced factors where you combine certain variables and maybe also one where you combine all variables. And then you will need to show that uh, the model fit of uh, the models with fewer, uh, with fewer variables 
is inferior to the full model or if it's not then you have a problem of discriminant validity. Another method that has been very popular is the Fauna and Larker method. You would look into average variance extracted and composite reliabilities and then you would compare uh, the, squared, uh, uh, the squared root of uh, average, average variance extracted with the other correlations and they, uh, they should be lower and then you would also conclude that you have a discriminability. Another method, not so common these days, would be looking at cross loadings. The items, it's at the item level, that the items should be well correlated with the same, uh, with the items in the same factor, but they should be uh, uh, much less correlated with items from other factors. In uh, recent years, uh, also we have uh, new methods, it's heterotrade monotrade ratio of correlations, or HTMT, and it looks also at items. Yeah? And again, like items, uh, uh, correlations within its factors compared to correlations with uh, items outside the original proposed uh, factors, and uh, they compute uh, ratio. This has been proposed by a group of authors, more used in information systems research and maybe marketing. At the bottom, you find a reference to an article that explains HTMT. And also, I like this article because it also introduces the other ways of how to calculate discriminant validity. In this video, I will not go into details of these different uh, ways of how to establish the screen. We are just explained. And if you're interested, uh, I refer you to the excellent literature, but also to other uh, videos. In phase three, in addition to scaling evaluation through confirmatory effect analysis, you would like to establish a nomological network so that uh, your new scale should be related uh, to certain variables that would we expect and it sh they should be unrelated with some other variables. To do so, you would usually collect another sample, maybe pilot study 3, uh, where you include related and unrelated variables. Then maybe you would run correlations or other tests to show uh, overlap and non-overlap with those variables. If you have gone through all these three phases, then I can say congratulations, you have uh, established a new scale. I think uh, you get the picture. Scale development is very complex. And thus, uh, you may want to think twice whether to develop a new scale. Alternatively, you can also use an existing scale and maybe modify or adapt it to your context. That would be much easier way, and you don't need to go through all these different steps. If you want to do it right, I describe these three steps. First, scale generation, second, scale refinement, and third, scale validation. I hope uh, this uh, introduction gave you an idea of what it means to develop a new scale. Good luck. Bye-bye.